thank you very much. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here. My name is Anke Höffler. Um, this is for a book launch um, for a book by uh, Phil Ressler, Ethnic Politics and State Power in Africa. Um, Phil is um, visiting the Blavatnik School of Government uh, for this academic year. He's an associate professor at the Department of Government at the College of William and Mary. And um, it's de facto a return to Oxford because we first met when we were post both postdocs here in, in, in Oxford. So if you want to do, uh, know how comparative politics is done in the best possible way, read this book. Um, so many people um, do lip service to the use of mixed methods. Phil does it, and he does it in an excellent way. So he offers perspectives on conflict, state building, and development. And the focus is on the region of sub-Saharan Africa, but the book does sort of end with a view of what does it teach us for uh, uh, regions outside uh, sub-Saharan Africa. He has also got another book with a co-author, Harry Verhoeven, uh, Why Comrades Go to War, Liberation Politics and the Outbreak of Africa's Deadliest Conflict. This uh, focuses in particular on the, on the DRC. Paul Collier is going to be the discussant, so we're going to have Phil present, um, you know, what he thinks are the most important aspects of his work, and then Paul is going to be the discussant. Unfortunately, uh, Paul Collier, um, Professor of Economics and now Professor here at the Blavatnik School of Government, is um, stuck on a train. So uh, we'll, we'll just start, and um, I hand over to Phil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anka. Uh, it is a pleasure to talk about my, my book tonight. I want to thank the Blavatnik School of Government for, for hosting this event and, in fact, hosting me uh, for a year. It, it's wonderful to be back in Oxford. I was here before, uh, as Anka uh, mentioned, and it's a very special place. and actually played a big part um, you know, in the process of writing, writing this book. And thank you so much to all who have uh, who've come tonight. Uh, it, it'll be a delight to engage with you on my book and think about its implications, policy implications, research implications uh, for our understanding of conflict uh, in weak states. So in tonight's talk, I'm going to provide an overview of the book. I'll provide its central arguments and the policy implications. But I'll also talk about the intellectual journey I made in researching and writing this book. So if this if this talk is a bit more personal uh, than most book talks, uh, forgive me. But as I mentioned, it, 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 it's a, a, you know, personal coming back to Oxford, given this is a place where I spent time as a postdoc, and this is where I spent time research uh, and writing the book. And it, it, it's also appropriate because the motivation for this intellectual journey was in many ways stirred by the two people sitting right here, Paul Collier and Uncle Huffler. I still remember reading uh, their seminal article on greed and grievance when I was a grad student, and then consuming all of their follow-on uh, articles, you know, including those on coups. Uh, and I think it is their work that inspired me and to, to think about coups and civil wars uh, together as a tr strate strategic trade-off that rulers face. So it is an honor to have them uh, here as discussants. So about the time I was reading Greed and Grievance in grad school, I was also interning for the International Crisis Group. I first interned for them uh, in their Washington, D.C. office. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to work uh, in their Nairobi office. I had worked in Kenya before. It was great to be back in Kenya. I was working on their Sudan team. And I had worked on Sudan uh, as an undergraduate, uh, I'd wrote an honors thesis on Sudan. I had very, you know, kind of preliminary knowledge uh, of the conflict. I was eager to learn more. I was eager to contribute to uh, you know, however I could uh, as an intern uh, for the International Crisis uh, Group. Now, I was there in Nairobi, Kenya, at a very interesting time. So this is 15 years ago. And if you recall, in 2002, the peace talks in Kenya were just beginning between the government of Sudan and the Sudan People's Liberation Army. Uh, and as the peace talks were beginning, uh, just they were taking place in Machakos, Kenya, as they were taking place, 
the violence was increasing on the battlefield. Right? The, the government of Sudan, the Sudan People's Liberation Army were jockeying to control that final bit of territory to lock in those gains ahead of those peace talks. Uh, and violence had, there was an uptick in violence in the oil fields region uh, of South Sudan, which of course had been contested in the upper part of southern Sudan for you know, a good you know, 10 years, if, if not much before that. Uh, but the government of Sudan was, was uh, undertaking a counteroffensive to try to increase uh, their control of more territory. And being an enterprising intern for the International Crisis Group, I thought I will go, uh, if I can, to South Sudan to do research on this uptick in violence to try to understand what impact might it have on the peace talks in Kenya. So I, uh, there was at that time a UN flight ban uh, into South Sudan, uh, but I found one uh, NGO that was flying food aid into South Sudan. And I convinced uh, them to let me hitch a ride. Uh, I flew up into South Sudan. They dropped me off. They dropped off food aid. They said, we'll, we'll come back three days to drop off more food aid to pick you up. Uh, let's just say this is the last intern that ever traveled outside of a uh, NG, uh, ICG or crisis group office. Uh, the next day, the front lines of the conflict in South Sudan moved closer to where we were. The village in which I was staying in my own county, the people uh, started to run, to, to, to flee the front lines, and I joined them. Uh, and we ended up you know, fleeing and running for the next three to four days. Uh, there were many searing memories that I, I, that I take away from that, that trip, but, but one of the most striking and surreal was four days after being on the run, right? The people I'm with in my own county, this is not the first time they've been displaced. You know, this is the fifth, sixth time that they've been displaced. After running for four days, we finally get into uh, Bar Ghazal outside of Unity State. We make it to the Bar Ghazal. And we're able to find a SPLA base so we can communicate with the NGO so they can you know, provide food aid, but also find me at this stage. Of course, the crisis group is, where's our intern? Where is he gone? Why is he in South Sudan uh, to get me out? And we, we reach this SPLA outpost, and they have a, a radio. And we're listening on the radio, and it's the BBC World Service. And they are reporting, nonetheless, on this counteroffensive by the government of Sudan against its own people in South Sudan. And they're interviewing interviewing the charge d'affaires from Sudan to Kenya about this counteroffensive. And I'll, I'll never forget the words that then crackle through that radio. This is a figment of your imagination. The ambassador charge completely denies that there's any violence going on and says it's a figment of your imagination. You know, sometimes when you're listening to the BBC, a faraway place, you know, you're hearing you know, one side or the other talk about the events, and you don't know, you know, surely he's lying, but you don't know. But there I was you know, with people from South Sudan who had been displaced by the conflict, and I know, knew this was all too real. And if I didn't know already, I knew then that I was going to devote my, my life work to trying to better understand conflict, to understand how we can prevent it, contain it, uh, and manage it. So I'm able, of course, uh, I'm, you know, the, Norway, the NGO comes, they, they drop off the food aid, I'm able to, to uh, get out. And a remarkable thing happens, of course, in Kenya. The peace talks gain ground, right? They gain traction, uh, and they, they uh, referendum, I mean, they, uh, the Manchaco's protocol is signed, and that protocol uh, gives the people of South Sudan, you know, the right to self-determination. This lays the groundwork for the larger uh, comprehensive peace agreement that is signed uh, in, in 2005, allowing for people of South Sudan to have the referendum in 2011 paving the way for their independence. <clears throat> so the independence that comes, of course, is a euphoric moment for the people of South Sudan. 50 years or more of persecution from their government in Khartoum, 
religious persecution, racial persecution, you know, constant warfare and bar bar bombardment, attacks like I saw in South Sudan, and they're finally able to gain their independence. Now, South Sudan's independence was only possible because of a strategic alliance between these two individuals, right? Salva Kiir, the current president uh, in the cowboy hat, and Riyak Machar, two individuals I'm sure many in the room are familiar with. During the war against the government of Sudan, there was a devastating split between, within the SPLA. At that time, the SPLA was headed by Dr. John Garang. And there was a dev devastating split between Riyak Machar and Dr. John Garang that tore the SPLA apart. This happens in 1991. The split continues for the next you know, decade. Devastating violence breaks out within South Sudan. Again, I'm sure many are familiar uh, with this. What happens is this split tears apart South Sudan. More people are killed on South on South violence than between uh, the government of Sudan and uh, the SPLA. And of course, the government of Sudan is happy to exploit this division to try to pro, you know, weaken the rebels and prolong the war. In 2000, you know, in the late 1990s, 2000, something happens in which the, the churches in South Sudan say, we need to end this violence. As long as we are against each other, fighting against each other, we will never have independence or we will never achieve peace, our ultimate goal. Uh, from the government of Sudan. And the churches put pressure on these leaders, uh, you know, at that time, Dr. John Garang, Rayak Machar, to come together, reunite, and you get the reunification of the SPLA. And part of that reunification is bringing Rayak Machar, who split from the SPLA, back into the fold. He becomes third in command. You have John Garang up, up top, and then Salva Kiir, and then Rayak Machar. So with this strategic alliance, Salva Kiir coming back in, bringing his soldiers. They're able to increase their pressure on Khartoum. And only with this uh, uh, alliance, you, you have the, um, the capability for South Sudan to extract this concession from Khartoum. But this, this worried me. Right At, at the time of independence, there were, there were you know, many challenges that the government of South Sudan faced. We all, you know, we, again, we're all very familiar with this. The challenges, uh, you know, decades of war leading to underdevelopment, heavy dependence on oil, you know, the, uh, you know, the work uh, that Paul and Anka have done showing the, the effect that uh, primary commodity dependence has on conflict risk. Uh, you know, low levels of human capital because of these war. But the one thing that I was, you know, particularly concerned about was the government of South Sudan, the, the essence of it rested on the strategic alliance. <clears throat> and my concern was, you know, could these elites embedded in these broader social groups, could they keep their country together and keep the government together? They had a lot to gain, right? A lot to gain from keeping this alliance together. They could remain you know, doing very well off the oil wealth. They could, of course, rebuild their country. Um, but what, what, why this worried me is because after working in South Sudan, I traded one war zone for another, and I traveled to Sudan. Uh, working in South Sudan, I became interested in Civil War onset, reading uh, you know, the, the, the work of uh, Paul and Anka in grad school and, and others, I became very interested in civil war onset. What causes civil war? And as I'm in grad school, you have a new war breakout in Sudan that, again, many are familiar with, and that's the war in Darfur, Sudan. Uh, and so this breaks out in 2003. Uh, so after working in South Sudan, I, I go uh, and, I, and I decide I'm going to write my PhD dissertation on civil war, and I'm going to focus on Sudan. I'm going to focus on the civil war in Darfur. Why did this civil war break out? Of course, there was a lot written uh, about Sudan, Darfur at the time. You know, it was in, you know, it was, um, there was a lot of media attention. There was a lot of discussion about it in the, the news. Many people attributed it to uh, drought desertification. There's also um, a lot of talk about this divide between Arabs and African. But what was striking to me is there was little po discussion of the effect of politics or how politics played a role. Uh, on, the, on the war uh, in Darfur. So I set off to Khartoum 
Uh, and I, and I, I spent 15 months in Sudan, living in Khartoum, traveling in Darfur to try to understand what caused the civil war in Darfur. Why did it break out in 2003? So the, the prevailing hypothesis of the time about why we get civil war links it to uh, what, what Ankar and Paul call feasibility, right? Uh, the, the state's capacity to effectively control its territory uh, and you know, um, police its territory and prevent uh, or mitigate the risk of conflict. So this is wh where civil war and rebellion is feasible because the government is weak or because the conditions are ripe to allow for a rebel movement to organize and emerge and sustain itself you know, due to natural resource dependence. Uh, you know, unemployed youth, you know, you're more likely to see civil war uh, break out. So the puzzle for me in looking at the weak state theory of civil war is why in some weak states like Sudan, and sometimes you get large-scale political violence, and at other times you don't. Right? What, what mediates the, the structural factors that predispose these states to having political violence how do state, what mediates that, what helps states prevent civil war? Um, why does it sometimes work and why does it sometimes, why it does, doesn't? And my research, you know, I, my background was an Africanist, right? Studying uh, the politics of Africa. Uh, and in the politics of Africa literature, there is a very strong focus on neo-patrimonialism. The role of, you know, informal political networks, the role of clientelism. And what was striking to me is there was a, a, a very large literature in African politics about the role of neo-patrimonialism, about the role of informal networks. But rarely was it brought to bear uh, in the Civil War literature. But, but in looking at the two, one could see these informal networks are the superstructure of the state and potentially the way that governments, regimes, accommodate potential rebels, potential dissidents, to prevent civil war. And so in looking at the, the Darfur Civil War, what struck me is in 1991, a decade, nearly a decade before the outbreak of the Darfur Civil War, the government of Sudan, the same government that was in power in 2003, it effectively defeated in a rebellion in Darfur. It did not use indiscriminate violence. Uh, it, it mobilized effectively, efficiently, working with local communities to isolate the, the rebels and to put down the uh, rebellion. So, so this was the motivation as I'm working in Sudan. Well, how did the government, the same government led by Omar al-Bashir, how did it manage to have such an efficient control of its uh, society in Darfur to be able to effectively put down this rebellion in, two, in 1991, but it failed in 2003. Uh, and what I discovered is that the government that put, you know, how Omar al-Bashir came to power, uh, he came to power in a coup in 1989 brought by the Islamic movement. And the Islamic movement was uh, a remarkable organization that had support throughout most of northern Sudan. And they were particularly strong in Darfur, Sudan. Right? They were very strong in the Nile River Valley, but also strong in Darfur. Many Darfurians had joined the Islamic movement from you know, secondary school in through university. Uh, and when, after coming to power in 1989, by 1990, you have, you know, of course, the war in South Sudan is continuing. John Garang teams up, allies, with a disaffected Islamist who tries to bring the war to Darfur. Right? And, and Garang is very happy to support uh, these dissidents and try to um, export the war to Darfur. This will weaken Khartoum. And of course, he, you know, Garang is very interested in building a national alliance to, to overthrow the government in Khartoum. But the government's able to effectively counter mobilize because of the Islamist, Islamist network in Darfur. Uh, as they catch their Islamist you know, brothers, tell them about this dissident who's coming. Uh, and these, these brokers, these Islamists who are Darfurian, they're respected by the top members of the movement because they are you know, uh, tried and true members of the movement. Uh, they're very influential. And, and they convince the government, say, no, 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 
let us try to handle this without using indiscriminate violence. And in fact, as the government and the army is predisposed to try to use you know, uh, mass incarceration um, and, and you know, violence to try to put down the rebellion, the, the Islamists from Darfur say, no, 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 release those you've arrested. Let us talk to the communities and convince them not to support the rebels. Uh, and because they were embedded in the communities, they had the support of these communities, and they convinced the communities not to support the rebels, and you get what I call cooperative counterinsurgency. Right? So this political network that was in place, having trusted local brokers, but who had influence at the top of the regime, were able to cooperate to avoid large-scale political violence. So the puzzle was, well, what happened in 2003? Where was this network that the government effectively used to police its territory? Um, what happened in 2003? In 1999 and 2000, Omar al-Bashir dismantled the Islamic movement. Right? He, he um, undermined and emasculated the network and mechanisms that they used to keep peace in Darfur. And that was a puzzle to me. Why, did the, why would a president do that? That seems um, you know, irrational. It, it, it seems very costly at the least. And what, what I, I found is that and, and many, uh, you know, those who know the Sudan case would know this well, a power struggle broke out at the top of the Islamic movement between the president, Omar al-Bashir, uh, and the, the key, you know, intellectual and uh, religious leader of the Islamic movement, Hassan al-Tarabi. Hassan al-Tarabi was the guiding figure behind the Islamic movement. Uh, he built it from the bottom up. He recruited... Uh, so many individuals to it, but he was not a military man. He was a lawyer trained in the Sorbonne. So he could not lead the coup that brought the Islamic movement to power. So they needed someone to play that role, and that was Omar, Omar al-Bashir. But then you had this two-headed monster, right? You had the figurehead, Omar al-Bashir, the military man who led the coup, behind the scenes, pulling the strings, Hassan al-Tarabi. Uh, and this caused friction in the Islamic movement. And more than, you know, more than friction, Omar al-Bashir was getting comfortable in his role as president. He was consolidating his power. Tarabi never lost sight that eventually the military would give way to a civilian rule and he would take over. But this led to a power struggle. And both were convinced that the other was going to move to take the other one out. And they could not credibly commit not to do so. Uh, and, the, and the Islamic movement um, you know, blew up with a big split between these two. The problem for Omar al-Bashir is he, so he, he, um, he purges Tarabi. He removes Tarabi from the Islamic movement. So he tries to thwart the threat that Tarabi poses. But he's not just worried about Tarabi, of course. Tarabi built the Islamic movement. He's worried about also Tarabi's loyalists and followers. Right? Those who are inside the movement who pose a threat, continue to pose a threat from inside. And so he also systematically removes them, purging um, Tarabi loyalists. Now, the, the split is open. Right? And, and the openness of the split help, helps Omar Bashir. Those line, the, Tarabi is allowed to start his own party. Those who support, support Tarabi line up next to him. And that's great for you know, the dictator. OK, I can see you know, who's lining up next to my enemy. That's great. But then he's worried, who are those who are not publicly lining up behind Hassan al-Tarabi? Uh, and I argue, and you know, having talked to many of the Islamists on both sides, that the president used ethnicity and really regional identity as an informational sh shortcut to kind of sort who was with him and who was against him. And there was a, a systematic purge of many Darfurian Islamists and those from Western Sudan to try to consolidate Omar al-Bashir's hold on power. But the cost of doing this, of consolidating his hold on power internally to coup-proof his regime from his former ally, was what? He dismantled the political networks you need to keep peace in weak states. Because in weak states, the, you know, the problem is you can't fall back on the bureaucracy. You can't fall back on state structures because those state structures are weak or they don't exist. 
but yet you need to do the essential functions that a state does. You need to collect information. You need to collect taxes. You need to disperse resources. Right? You need an infrastructure to do that. And in weak states, this infrastructure are these alliances and these networks. Um, so there was a, a devastating kind of implication that came from my reading of the Sudan case. So, so this is a very, you know, so the, the, the central argument that comes out of the book, it's, you know, it's very inductive. It comes from spending, uh, you know, extensive amount of time in Sudan to try to understand, you know, the politics of the outbreak uh, of the, the civil war in Darfur. But there's a devastating implication of what the trade-off that Omar al-Bashir is faced with. Right? He's trying to coup-proof his regime. He's trying to consolidate his hold on power. He's trying to increase, increase the costs that Hassan al-Tarabi faces to try to come back to power. And, he, and he, to increase those costs, he's excluding them from the regime. Uh, and he's excluding those loyalists from the regime. But in doing so, um, he is, of course, increasing the risk of civil war. He's you know, undermining his ability to you know, police these areas uh, and increases the risk of civil, civil war. So, so the, the, the devastating implication is that these rulers face a coup civil war trade-off. And the, the, what underpins this trade-off is how in weak states can these elites embedded in these networks, and these networks are critical for keeping the peace, uh, how can you credibly commit to share power? Right? So Omar al-Bashir, you know, he needs these allies from Darfur. That was you know, visibly true in 1991. That helped him defeat the rebellion in Darfur. He needs them to keep the peace. But in bringing them in and allowing them to stay in the regime, it reduces their costs to overthrow him in a coup. And at this time, of course, you know, Hassan al-Tarabi is absolutely going after Omar al-Bashir's seat. So in weak states, when you need these uh, allies to, to maintain control of your territory and society, how can you be sure that the allies you're bringing in into your regime can credibly commit not to overthrow you? Uh, and the challenge in these weak states, when you don't have strong parties, you don't have strong constitutions, uh, how can you, what, what is going to regulate power sharing between these forces. And of course, the only way these power brokers get into power to begin with is they have to be able to mobilize violence. Right? You get your way into power by mobilized violence, mobilizing violence. The, 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 now you are in power. What guarantee or assurance do I have as the ruler that you will not continue to use that to increase your share of power? Uh, and this is, leads to incredible uncertainty. So working in, in Darfur, I, I, in, in Sudan, I take away this, uh, you know, this striking kind of implication that in weak states, rulers face this devastating trade-off. Uh, and again, it was bringing together uh, coups and civil wars in a way that they haven't been studied. They hadn't really been seen as a strategic kind of trade-off, two sides of the same coin. Usually, they were studied as discrete events. We get coups, and then we get civil wars. Uh, I, I'm looking at these as, you know, a, a two, again, two sides of the, the same coin. Moreover, I'm bringing in the role that informal political networks play in keeping the peace, right? Uh, and the challenge is, how can you, you know, these violent specialists embedded in these different networks, how can they commit to, to power sharing? And so going um, from the Darfur case, I then um, want to test this across sub-Saharan Africa. Because in many uh, you know, African states, you have similar conditions as in Sudan. Right? You have weak political institutions. You have you know, the political importance of ethnicity. You have ethnic groups that are geographically concentrated. The, you know, these political networks bridging these ethnic divisions are, are critical to keep the peace. And so I, I rely on the ethnic power relations data set, um, which gives us information on access to political power by you know, different ethnic groups. And I, I combine that with my own data I collect on the ethnicity of coup conspirators. 
And what I show is that this trade-off, you know, we see evidence for this, that if a ruler includes a rival ethnic group into the central government, they're significantly more likely to face a coup from those uh, ethnic rivals. If you exclude those rivals, they're, they're less likely to overthrow you in a coup, but they're more likely to overthrow you, or more likely to challenge you in an armed rebellion. Now, going from um, these cases, I said, okay, I see this, you know, you know, observable implications that are consistent with the Sudan case. Let me look at the cases, and do we actually see evidence from these cases of a similar dynamic, that you have strategic alliances that are forged, that you know, allow these um, alliances to come to power, then the challenge they face of committing and sustaining these alliances in the shadow of the coup d'etat, they break down, leading to ethnic exclusion and civil war. And actually, you know, when I look, went back and looked at some of these cases, it was striking the way they mapped on to the Sudan case. You know, for those who know Chad, Hissen Habre, Idris Deby come together, forge an alliance, march to power in the early 1980s. Habre becomes president, Deby head of the army. You know, they, they work together to, to, to take power. Can they credibly commit to keep the peace? They cannot. It breaks down, leading to uh, devastating civil war. Similar case for those know, who know Liberia. Right? These four individuals, they launch a coup d'etat. They overthrow americo liberian rule. Now they control the Liberian government. All they have to do is share power amongst themselves, and they can't do it. And within a decade, they all end up dead at each other's hands. But even worse, they divide the Liberian state along ethnic lines as Doe desperately tries to consolidate his, his hold on power using ethnic exclusion uh, to do so. Um, and then when I was looking at the data, I was struck by another case that the data pointed to. And that was Africa's Great War, the war that breaks out in Congo in August 1998. This was kind of off my radar. Uh, I hadn't studied you know, much of Congo, Central Africa. But there it was, the data was pointing to it, that Laurent Tesere Kabila, you know, after coming to power with an alliance with Congolese Tutsi from Eastern Congo, he excludes them from power to try to coup-proof his regime, um, but at the cost of a devastating civil war. So I was, I was very wary, having spent 15 months in Sudan, of pursuing the Congo case. Um, but I gave a talk here at Oxford on, my, on the Sudan case. And after the talk, I met Harry Verhoeven. Uh, and, and Harry came up to me, and he said, you know, he also had a you know, great interest in Sudan. He's written, written a great book on Sudan. But he said, what other cases are you looking at? And I said, well, the data is pointing in the direction of Congo, but the, I, you know, I don't know if I'm ready to tackle Congo, having tackled Sudan. Harry said, well, I've just come back from interning in the Belgian embassy in Kinshasa. Uh, I'd be happy you know, to talk to you about this. And we teamed up together to, to you know, go to Central Africa, to Congo, to Rwanda, um, to better understand how the coup civil war trap played out in, um, in Central Africa. And then we, we've since um, written a standalone book on this case, which thinks about the coup civil war trap in regional perspective. How, how, the, how the, you know, the coup civil war trap within this post or this anti-Mobutu alliance breaks down, lean, leading to regionalized civil war. OK, so, so as I'm doing this research, I'm, you know, to wrap up here, um, as I'm doing this research, there's one case that I come, keep coming back to, right? And that's South Sudan. So this is, you know, this is, um, you know, 2011, you know, 2012, 2013. South Sudan's having its independence. Can the regime hold together? And I, you know, I've just spent a decade documenting the challenges that these elites face of, you know, credibly committing to power. And I'm very worried about the South Sudan case. Um, and, and what happens is actually the United States government is also worried about this. And they reach out uh, to me and they say, what do you see as the pathways to state failure in South Sudan? Well, ha you know, seeing 
the South Sudan government pretty much hinging on this strategic alliance, having spent a decade looking at this coup civil war trade-off, seeing it play it out time and time again, um, leading to devastating consequences. I say, here's how my, what my expectation is. We have to be you know, very careful about this alliance between these two. Uh, what I see is it, you know, a spark is all that's needed you know, uh, for Kiir to fear a coup, you know, leading to a purge, which d divides the regime along ethnic lines, and you get full-scale civil war. So I don't know, you know what the United States government did with that information. Um, but I, w I want to think about the policy implication because we all know what then happens, right? It's, it's pretty much a textbook case of this uncertainty, the shadow of the coup d'etat haunting, haunting Salva Kiir. He's convinced Riyak Machar is going after his seat, and for good reason, because Riyak Machar said he's going to go after his seat, but he was trying to play the party route. But of course, that was not convincing to Salva Kiir because. You know, in 1991, you tried to overthrow the SPLA using violence. What's to stop you from, from doing that? And South Sudan, um, you know, breaks down. And we see it play out, you know, in real time, you know, um, following the very same dynamics, leading to this devastating civil war. So, so what went wrong in South Sudan? And what are the implications, the policy implications here? You know, and, you know, having, you know, knowing the basic mechanics of how these regimes break down. Is there anything that we could have done, could have been done differently? Why, you know, what went wrong in South Sudan? You know, the, there's no doubt the deck was stacked against South Sudan, as we all know, right? You know, they, it was a perfect storm of conditions um, leading to, to civil war. Um, so it's a, it's a big ask, of course, to, um, to suggest any one factor might have prevented uh, the civil war, but I think there's more that could have been done to try to maintain this uh, uh, and regulate power at the top of the regime. So, so first off, I think one problem was there was a fixation of the policy community on what? Making sure you had a peaceful partition between North Sudan and South Sudan. That was the overwhelming concern. That was the fear. We didn't want an India-Pakistan type situation. We didn't want an Ethiopia-Eritrea repeat. You know, let's try to get a peaceful partition. And there was a lot of focus on that, and for good reason, right? You have the ABA crisis. You have you know, the flashpoints in Heglidge. Uh, you know, there's good reason for that. But it came, I think, at the expense of investing in strengthening the party institutions of the Sudan's People's Liberation Movement. Right? There, was, there was not enough resources, attention, emphasis put on strengthening these party rules and making sure the actors, the key players, abided by these rules. And Salva Kiir started to shirk uh, and try to cheat uh, and undermine the rules, and that contributed to uncertainty. So, so I think a big question is, could more have been done? And then this was compounded by allowing the militarization of Juba. Right? Salva Kiir, Riyak Machar, they're allowed to arm themselves you know, to the, the teeth. And so as you get this uncertainty, Juba's militarized, and you have you know, um, really ripe conditions for, for these things um, to blow up. And I think there's also another kind of lesson here, and that's the limitations of external intervention when it comes to the coup civil war trade-off. Um, and we see this, actually, another striking case of the coup civil war trade-off is Iraq uh, and the breakdown of, of the Iraqi government um, uh, in, in 2011. And what's interesting about this, both of these South Sudan case and the Iraq case, the US government was intimately evolved, right? And they knew very well these players. They knew the intimate details of these power structures uh, and the power struggles, yet they, they could not, they either refused to intervene or they could not intervene because this was the most sacrosanct sanct part of the sovereign state, right? The, the executive body. You know, how can we intervene here? We can't intervene. And in both cases, I think both executives took cues from the US government oh, you know, the US isn't you know, pushing back very hard, they aren't you know, you know, publicly. Um, sending signals, this is license for me to take out my rival and consolidate my hold on power. And both things blow up, both cases blow up in, um, 
in civil war. Okay, so let me just conclude here thinking about uh, a really important development in, in sub-Saharan Africa is that if we can't intervene in the ex executive, right, we can't mediate between these elites because it's very difficult to do so, can we do more to bar coups as a pathway to sovereign power? Right? So if we, if, we, if we outlaw coups, that will take away a lot of uncertainty that rulers have and you know, hopefully will lead to you know, more democratic, peaceful states. And we've seen exactly this in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in which you have this uh, emergence of a very strong anti-coup rule that the African Union has been enforcing and other regional uh, organizations have been enforcing. Uh, and there are, you know, the, the African Union is very quick to act if someone uses force to come to power. You will not be recognized as a sovereign leader. You will be suspended from the African Union. Time and time again, the African Union uh, has, has done it. So much so that it's very, di you know, it, uh, it's no longer possible to come to power by force in the sense that you will not be sovereign, gain sovereign recognition. You, if you want to stay in power and be a member of the African Union, you better step aside to allow someone else to play that role. There's been one important exception here to this, and that's the Egypt case. Um, but outside of Egypt, the African Union is very, very, very good, very good on this. And, and some say this has led to a significant reduction in coups. But I, I would argue the AU's regime of constitutionalism has been imbalanced or one-sided. Um, because this is a club of incumbents, right? The African Union. They are now outlawing coups. Who overtakes, undertakes coups? Your rivals, right? So they are pretty much using the African Union to coup-proof the regimes. Well, that, I mean, it's great to reduce this as a mechanism for coming to power, right? Uh, it, it, it can do much more harm than good, but the problem is the use of violence is also accountability mechanism, right? Not our preferred one. We prefer institutional mechanisms or democracy, but force can be one. So they are shielding themselves from coups, but are they themselves tying their own hands with constitu you know, strict constitutional restraints? Uh, and we don't see evidence of that. Why? Because we see a number of incumbents running you know, roughshod over term limits, launching what some consider constitutional call, coups, and staying in power. Um, and this is leading to, uh, I think, a resurgence of personalist rule and actually undermining accountability uh, in democracy in, in Africa. So the solution to this, of course, is not, let's not reinstate coups. Let's strengthen constitutional safeguards and limits and constraints against executives to have a more balanced regime of constitutionalism. And why, of course, is that important? Because underlining the coup, underlying the coup civil war trap is personal rule and weak institutions. Unless we fix those, we won't be able to escape this trap. So I'll leave it there uh, and welcome the, the discussion. Thank you so much. Great. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome our discussant, uh, Professor Paul Collier. Um, you missed your introduction earlier, I won't repeat it. Um, he's um, a, a, a fantastic discussant for this um, book because you are the first footnote. Oh. <laughs> um, right. Um, well, I agree with quite a bit of that, but it's boring to agree, isn't it? So let me try and say something different. Um, and I, I think the, the fundamental problem in a lot of Africa is you've got a combination of weak states in fragmented societies. Um, not just that, you've got weak states in fragmented societies, but um, the, the inherited model is of centralized state. And so African governments have trying to have been trying to run centralized states without nations. And, um, and that fundamentally doesn't work because without a sense of nation, um, people won't voluntarily comply 
with the state. Um, and that, if you've got that, um, a state without compliance, you've got a menu of three options. And we see it all, in all, the, all around. Not everywhere in Africa, but it's pretty common. So one menu is, okay, people don't comply voluntarily, we'll force them. Right? So that's the coercive model of one group. One, one faction's in power, it coerces other groups. There's no, there's no voluntary compliance, but there's coercion. Plenty of that around. Um, the second option, which is sort of where sort of put Anchor and I in business, was the state tries that, um, but isn't strong enough. It's just not got enough force to have effective peace through mass coercion. And so then you're into violent conflict of one shape or another. Um, and, the, uh, and there's plenty of that. And then the third choice on the menu um, is, is basically uh, run government as theater. So uh, do the donor dance and try and pretend in front of the donors that you're a government, um, a centralized government, but don't actually try and do it. Um, so you don't actually deliver any services. You just say you're going to to the donors and they give you money and so, so you, the menu is basically uh, effective coercion, um, coercion that doesn't do its job and so you lead to conflict, or government as theatre. Um, the, um, what's the way out of that? And here I suppose I want to push back on what you said. Um, I think a lot of this is due to um, uh, I suppose with Twitter and all this lot, one's got to be a little bit cautious. Um, uh, it's due to um, uh, the, the foolishness of, um, of U.S. Um, conception of, um, of, 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 of what states should look like in societies where you've got um, a no, no sense of nation and, a, and a, a, so a fractured society and a weak state. And the, um, the US model, not just in Africa, but I mean, look, look what the US did in Iraq, which you, you, you held up as if it was some sort of, the, the, the government didn't listen enough to America. I mean, the government listened far too much to America um, because what America wants wanted and wants everywhere is um, how do you establish an effective state? Well, you make the state legitimate. How do you do that? Same way as we do in America. Uh -huh. uh, you hold an election. Um, and um, uh, and it, in, in societies that don't have a sense of nation, it doesn't work. The people who, as it were, lose don't give a damn whether they've got fewer votes or more votes than the people who win. They've lost power to some group that is going to um, use its power against them. Um, and so um, uh, the, these sort of centralized states with, um, with, with elections are, are just a recipe for, for you know, the, the, the only way you can organize these electoral contests in fragmented societies is if each group, ethnic group or religious group has its political party and then the discourse of the, the narratives that are put out by the political parties are always you vilify the other party, but in a fragmented society, you're vilifying other groups. And so far from building a nation, you further fragment the nation. I mean, look at Kenya, um, which incidentally is close to being an exception. I mean, it's, 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 it seems to me perfectly obvious that the Kikuyu are not going to give power, allow the Kikuyu to come to, to the Lua to come to power. 
And whether you call that winning an election by fair means, winning an election by slightly elastic means, or a, or a coup, uh, it's, it's, that's sort of, in a way, semantic. Um, the, um, so, what's the alternative? I'm going to... Anka, you must make sure I shut up. Um, uh, yeah, because we would like to finish by seven and have a little bit of time for um, A, to give Phil the chance to respond and uh, further questions. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to leave before seven, otherwise I'll get killed at home. So. <laughs> um, the, um, 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 I've got three hungry kids. Um, so um, what do we do if we've got this cocktail of weak states and fragmented societies? How do we get out of having this menu of um, either effective coercion, conflict, or theater? Um, and I think the answer is you need an utterly different um, structure to the state, uh, which, which is nothing, which you absolutely don't hold a national election. You absolutely don't do that. What you do is construct, um, is you establish the, the red lines of each faction, of each group, and you build a political structure which says, whatever else happens, none of these red lines are going to be crossed. And that's all that the center does. The center just polices those red lines. Now, South Sudan started with something. First of all, South Sudan only became a state because Johnny Garang died or was killed. Johnny Garang did not want South Sudan to be an independent state for a very good reason. Um, and um, the, um, uh, the, quite clearly, the, 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 the conflict, the, recent, the current conflict started when uh, Silver Keir crossed a red line and sacked his rival as vice president. So there was an absolutely blatant crossing of a red line. Um, so, is it, I mean, a, a more successful model here is, is Lebanon, which, you know, you, you look at Lebanon and you think, why on earth isn't this place a continuous conflict? And it always sort of teeters on the edge of conflict, um, but it's got a very careful power-sharing structure, which doesn't depend upon how many votes different parties get. You know? Always there's a Christian who's president, a Sunni who's prime minister, and the head of the parliament is a Shia. You know, so that's, that, that's the structure. And it, it's nothing to do with democracy. I mean, you can call it democracy if you like. Um, but, but that preserves every side's red lines without having to go into conflict. Now, we'll have to see over the next month or two whether Saudi Arabia has finally managed to mess that up by crossing somebody's red line. Who knows, you know? Um, uh, so the scope for external actors to mess things up is always considerable. Um, what external actors need to be doing is doing their best to sort of, if you like, guarantee the red lines. Um, once you've got a structure of government at the center in which the red lines can't be crossed, there's probably nothing else at the center that you can do. In societies where different, people, different groups hate each other, have no trust, there's really very little scope for cooperation at the center. The primary task of the government at the center, in my view, in these sort of societies, is just stop it going violent. And then, what do you do to get some cooperative development? You decentralize. And so to my mind, that's the, the, the sort of viable structure is a, a political system which doesn't hold national elections. That produces a winner and a loser, which is disastrous. You just have these sort of ad hoc designs which protect red lines. And then having kept the peace, you then decentralize. Um, the, uh, a, a, good, a good example of decentralization keeping the peace 
is actually Nigeria. You know, there's loads of things wrong with Nigeria, but um, uh, it's not gone back to civil war over the oil. I'll come to why it's had a, a war in the north in a moment. Um, but um, half the oil is just divided amongst all the states by a formula. And that decentralization of, uh, of, of oil revenues has meant that there's enough in it for each group not to, um, not to go back to conflict. Um, the, um, so, to my mind, that's, that's the, the feasible way out in fragmented societies in the short term to getting back to peace. Um, of course, the longer term agenda is build a nation. And uh, all nations are artificial constructs. You know, this is the myth of shared identity, but very valuable myths of shared identity. And in Africa, um, two societies have long done that. One is Nureri did that in Tanzania. When Nureri came to power, he said, I've got a nation, I've got 50 tribes. And then he spent a lot of, he said, we dare not have electoral democracy, it'll tear the place apart. And so Nureri, to my mind, very sensibly said, no electoral democracy. Um, just uh, uh, let's change the narratives coming out of central government. Let's use the symbols and the narratives that build a shared identity. And there were very smart things he did, like moving. Nobody could work in a senior capacity in the civil service and be in their own region. So that he created a sense of, of Tanzanian. Uh, Botswana, say the same thing. Botswana, the sense of nation. Botswana, on independence, was a, uh, an odd combination of a nation without a state. Because the state was run from Mafeking in, in South Africa. But it, but it had got a sense of nation. I think. Um, much more recently, you're seeing that attempt in Rwanda. And the latest research data I've seen on attitudes um, it suggests it's actually being successful, that the narratives of shared identity are actually starting to work. You've, you know, you've only had 23 years coming out of the worst possible state failure, but it seems to me to be a success. I, personally, I don't get very hung up about um, term limits. Britain doesn't have term limits. Um, you do, term limits are a good idea if you have a, an awful leader you want them out. An even better idea is don't get an awful leader. Um, uh, I don't think uh, Kagame is an awful leader. I think he's pretty good. Um, finally, um, let me try a, a simpler explanation, which is a supplementary explanation to why you get this. You either do coups or you do civil wars. And I'm going to take us back to Nigeria. And if you remember when um, um, Nigeria returned to democracy and Obasanjo came in as a, not as the general but as the democratic president, um, uh, and then with a brief interlude was succeeded by good luck Jonathan, both both Obasanjo and Jonathan were considered uh, southerners. And the big, I mean, there are many splits in Nigeria, but the big structural shift is north-south. North, north Islam, south Christian. And, um, and the army had historically been overwhelmingly northern Muslim because the north was poorer than the south, and so it was much easier to recruit into the army from the north and the south. And so the north, the, 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 the army was effectively a northern institution. So if you were Christian presidents of Asanio and Good Luck Jonathan, what was your big fear? Your big fear was that you were going to be ousted by the army. Um, and so, you know, you look down the menu of what can we do about it, and uh, having an effective but loyal army, they couldn't find that on the menu. Right? It just wasn't on the menu. And so 
if you can't have an army which is effective and loyal, you can either have an army which is effective but not loyal, or loyal, or or loyal but not, or you know, or ineffective but not loyal. Um, you you go, you go for the ineffective army, and um, and I think over um, 19 years, that's effectively what happened in Nigeria. You, 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 got an ineffective army. And it, that didn't seem much of a risk because the oil region in the, was in the south. It was Christian, it was especially with both Obasanya and especially Good Luck Jonathan. Good Luck Jonathan was, was from the oil region. And so um, the, 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 the danger of violence in the, in the oil region was small. Um, and they didn't anticipate that you know, basically, Saudi Arabia would start financing Islamic uh, uh, mili- you know, is, is, is jihad um, in the, across the Sahel, which it did. Um, and that then, for that, you needed an army, but you didn't have one. Now you've got a northern president. He's trying to put that back in place. He's trying to put the army back in place. Um, so... In a, in a nutshell, my sort of supplementary explanation is that you face a choice as a leader. You can, it's, you've, got, you've got to ask, is the army a threat? If you think it's a threat, you can weaken the army. But then as you do that, you've got less capacity to repress effectively. And so you move from being... A, a state that's got enough coercion, coercive power to keep the peace, a sort of North Korea peace, to the, the, the sort of state which, um, which tries to repress but just hasn't got enough oomph behind it. And so you either see coup or you see uh, conflict. Thank you. The um, Phil and Paul to sort of sit here, um, and you then sit in the I'll sit in the middle. <laughs> I don't think it's that controversial. Um, <laughs> Phil, I would have loved to give you give you um, time to respond to Paul, but maybe I'll I'll rather because everybody's been very patient. Yes. Um, give everybody the opportunity to ask questions, and then you can maybe take also the opportunity to um, answer um, okay, Paul's concerns. Yeah. I'll open the floor then. Who would like to go first and ask a question or make a comment? I heard lots of murmuring, so uh, I'm sure you have some, some suggestions or comments. I mean, one thing... Yes, please. Yeah, well, Fantastic. Picks up on Benedict Anderson's point about uh, nations as imagined communities, um, but I just wondered to what extent you could also say that of ethnic groups, and and how that might feed into to the comments that you were making. Sorry, I just missed the. Um, you missed uh, the the question was, uh, could you also say the same about ethnic groups, or about religious groups? Oh, to what yeah, extent yeah. are these things yeah, also valuable, and yeah. how would that feed into the analysis that uh, that you presented? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, well, it's not controversial, but a lot of the ethnic groups are kind of relatively recent amalgams. The, the, uh, in many ways, the funniest is in Kenya, the Kalanjin. Um, the Kal- Kal- Kalanjin date deep back into the midst, mists of time, um, namely about 1942. Um, right? So before, the, before 1942, there wasn't a group called the Kalanjin. Um, and it was built by a, a radio recruit, recruitment program by the British Army um, in, an area, in, a, in a poor area of Kenya. They thought, you know, where do you get soldiers? It's a place that's poor. So the, they recruited in what's the area called the Nandi-speaking peoples. And so they found a central dialect in Nandi. And the radio program each day to try and get people to join the army started with, listen here, listen here, in this Nandi dialect, which was Kalanjin, Kalanjin. Right? I roll on to 1978, and one of these guys becomes president. So then, every, you know, then everybody wants to be a Kalanjin, um, because that's where the power is. 
And then, I mean, on that regarding, uh, so thinking about what role ethnicity plays in the, in the coup civil war trade-off, right? Um, so from my perspective, uh, you know, absolutely political mobilization does not need to happen along ethnic lines, right? And this, the, at the root of this trade-off is this political problem, this commitment problem, how do we respect these red lines, right? How do we respect power sharing, respect each other's right to have some share, share power and not try to, um, you know, try to appropriate your share and take it for your own. So, you know, that's a political problem. Uh, it, it need not happen along ethnic lines, but we see that ethnicity can be a very effective form of mobilization, right? And why is that? Because of, uh, you know, dense social ties, right, that come from shared kinship. Uh, your norms of reciprocity, which become the backbone of collective action. And then I think, importantly, geographic concentration, right? And because you have these strong networks, you know, it, it's, this, it's that ethnicity and political networks co-vary, right, is, what, is what's happening. And because they reduce the cost of mobilization, collective action, you have uh, ethnicity, you know, po politics along ethnic lines. And the challenge is, uh, when you have these politics uh, along ethnic lines, how do we you know, you know, share power, um, but, and then how do we keep the peace if we exclude our rivals f from power? But the, th this is quite damning for, for some ethnic groups that are, you know, smaller ethnic groups, right? Because you just don't have the same capabilities to effectively respond if you're excluded from power. And that's one thing that comes out of my, my book in the, the penultimate chapter. I think about the flip side of this trade-off, and, and where, does, where do we get peace from, right? If, if my argument is that rulers have these strong incentives to choose civil war over coups because civil war is the lesser evil, that distant, you know, like the northern Nigeria, the distant threat far from the capital, you know, when do we ever, you know, when do they accept power sharing and accept the threat of coups? And what I show is that rulers are more likely to include their rivals in power when those rivals have strong threat capabilities, can project power in the capital. Uh, and how do they project power in the capital? It depends on their distance to the capital, their size, their ability uh, to mobilize. When a, a group has that capability, they can punish or hold accountable the ruler if they exclude them from power. Right? Um, so for big groups, that's great. Right? You're always in the political game. Uh, if you, you, you're a big group close to the capital, you're, you're always in the political game. Your chances of being included are high. Um, when you're a small ethnic group, in the periphery, you know, the, the likelihood of being included in power is going to be you know, much less. From the ruler's standpoint, there's you know, really no benefit to bring you in because you have strong incentives to try to lock in power in a coup because you know being in power, if you're excluded, the likelihood of you returning to power being low. Or, you know, to put it differently, your ability to hold the ruler accountable for excluding you from power is low. So, the, so what this suggests is that exactly, you know, if bases of social mobilization can change, then potential for peace can change, right? So if you have small ethnic groups, you know, in the periphery, and this is what John Garang was trying to do. He was absolutely a unionist. And John Grang, what he was trying to do was to ch change the basis of political mobilization away from, you know, Dinka, Nuer, uh, you know, against, you know, Riverine Arabs, you know, dividing Sudan. He wanted to change the basis of political mobilization. Um, and I think if the basis of political mobilization is changed, that in increases groups' threat capabilities, ability increases their ability to bargain with the center, and, and you're more likely to have... Um, you know, peace or hold your accountability is a better word for that. But then the challenge is, you know, how do you build these, you know, how do you reimagine communities or how do you change political bases of mobilization? We've got another question over here. Um, you didn't mention at all, I think. Oh, uh, sorry, for, for, yeah, thank you. Um, you didn't mention at all, I think, international peacekeeping or containment forces in this context. Do you think that UNMIS could have done more to contain the conflict that erupted in South Sudan in uh, the end of 2013 and, of course, continues today? And what do you think about the effectiveness of such forces generally? Should we take a few? Should we? 
I can, yeah. Yeah, so I think um, on that, I mean, yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I think one important factor is, you know, peacekeeping is very, we're, we're getting good at keeping the peace when you have, you know, rebel movements in a government that are geographically separated uh, and there are boundaries that we can monitor and, you know, separate these forces, right? Uh, I, I think we're, we're seeing mo much more robust peacekeeping on these fronts, and it's, it's helping to reduce violence. Uh, the, the challenge in the South Sudan case, as I, as I you know, kind of alluded to, was the, the critical you know, point was within the regime at the highest level. Uh, and you know, I'd, I'd have to you know, research this more, but again, you had this militarization of Juba, militarization of these elite networks, and what was you know, you know, the UN... What were they doing to try to mitigate that, reduce that? They obviously had good, you know, um, ties. They, you know, with Salva Kiir and Riyadh. I mean, they were, you know, communicating with them. But their ability to insert themselves, insert themselves, was low because that that becomes neo trusteeship, right? Because now we are inserting ourselves in the highest level, uh, you know, really serving as a third party mediator of the executive branch, and that looks more like neo trusteeship which the UN has been much you know, less likely to do as opposed to mediating between forces that are geographically separated. Great. Um, yes, please. Uh, I have a question for Professor Polcolio. And you said that U.S. has failed to deliver the result by introducing liber liberal uh, democracy in these African countries under um, uh, war. And uh, so I imply there are some uh, preconditions for this kind of democracy to work. So, and that was missing in, in the previous teaching on the democracy. And the second question is when you introduce, when you're emphasizing your recipe of having a uh, a uh, structure that can ensure everybody, every group won't cross the red line. What can be the strength and the force that can make this balance? Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's a question to say. Sorry, it's for filming purposes. <laughs> so I don't think I have the right words to sort of like make my question very clear yet. But, so I'm from Uganda, um, and I think you know what's happening in Uganda right now with like the president trying to change the constitution and all of that. Um, so this has happened before, um, and it is happening again because the president, for those of you that don't know, he's 73, the constitution of Uganda says you can only be president when you're between 35 and 75. He will be set, like older than 75 when the next election comes about, and so he's trying to change the constitution. And you did say that the African Union has succeeded in its anti in its anti coup policies, um, and it could do something, you know, it could do something to prevent these things by, um, I forget the word that you use, but basically by like um, protecting the rights of the constitution and all of that. So what sorts of things could they actually be doing? And are they the only possible stakeholders in actually protecting the constitutions? Or like, can the local people to be um, sort of like, like, do they have a role in that? And how do they even like, because my thinking is, or at least like what I was thinking is, like, did um, the anti-coup policies succeed because the African leaders who are in, who were in power were willing to buy into that because that protects them and it keeps them in power? And so, if protecting the constitution, you know, will make sure that they are actually out of power, are they then going to comply with uh, protecting the constitution? Right. I'm going to just go around and take one last set of questions and then I'll give you final word. Please. Yeah, I really enjoyed your talk. I'm sure I wait for this. Yeah. Thank you. I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, thanks for speaking here. I just wondered um, how you would respond to the potential criticism that you're really, are you advancing that all nations need a Western style, US style state system? Mm -hmm. I, I think you said right towards the end of your comments that you need, we need to address the problem of weak institutions. Is this, is this essentially a manifesto for the Fabarian state and spreading it across the world? Is that a problem? 
And if so, how would you respond to that? Great. Thank you. I think there at the back was another question. Yes, please. I just wait for the microphone, please. Sure. Thank you very much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. So I'm from Nigeria. And I'm very interested in what Pro Professor Collier was talking about um, establishing red lines. Because the general sense on the country right now is that there won't be a 2019 general elections, given the way the present administration has been going and the repression and other things that have been happening. So I like it. Uh, I understand your point about a society that is fragmented, probably do not need electoral democracy. And of course, the problem with my country is that they've always seen, them, they've always seen the election as equivalent to democracy and the solution to everything. But of recent, we're like, we are realizing that is not the way. And I like the idea of establishing right lines. So I just wanted you to explain more what you mean or what would that really constitute of. Great. I caught something. Yeah, there. A last, uh, last question, please. And then we'll give the participants a chance to respond. Yes. Just wait for the microphone, please. All right, yeah. thank you very much. I think it's a good presentation. I want to just add to my sister here from Uganda. We've seen the same happening by constitutional change in Rwanda, where Paul Kagame, he changed the constitution just to, re, to go for re-election. So I don't know, like, do you think in that sense uh, Afro-AU is effective? And then you also mentioned the, the point that um, the, there are some exceptions when it comes to Egypt case. So which means that if countries are seeing these exceptions, they could try to draw their own exceptions out of that. But I, I have a main concern because I'm thinking that we are, we are reducing everything, like my sister from Nigeria also mentioned, everything to just election. But I think the main content that we need to take critical look is the winner takes all practice because uh, we, we, we kind of keep seeing the same problem, keep recurring, just because of winner takes all. Because people think that uh, when my government is in power or my party is in power, they control everything, even to the level of changing the constitution to suit their, their own philosophy. So how do we move from that level of making it more of inclusive democracy where everybody will feel will feel part of the system and then be happy. Thank you. A great last question. I will let um, Paul speak first. Yeah, I mean, uh, don't try and put the cart before the horse, right? The cart is the national election stuff. The horse is a sense of shared identity. Until you build a sense of shared identity, um, uh, this sort of electoral democracy is just not going to work. And uh, it, it's starting to work, I'd say, in, um, in Ghana and in Senegal. Um, that's quite impressive where um, there's been a long enough tradition of um, sort of respect for the, the electoral rules uh, within reason. And um, more importantly, there's been social learning that... Um, a government which is really rapacious and predatory is not very good. Even, you know, even if it's from your own group, basically these ga this gang is sort of feathering their own nest, not the group's ne nest. And so in both Senegal and Ghana, you've recently, the last five years, had elected um, oppositions which came in not on a program of we'll spend money, not on a program of it's our turn to eat, um, but on a program of um, you know, the, the previous guys have really messed up this economy. Um, we're going to have to be a long period of, of prudence. Um, you know, the, 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 the president of Senegal came to power with a commitment, we're going to cut spending because we've been spending too much. He won. You know? So there is social learning and democracy is feasible in Africa. But it is that process of a long period of building enough shared identity and enough learning from the agonies of history um, that it then works. And so um, that, that's really my, my sort of bottom line, that trying to get that uh, 
out of string, trying to fantasize that um, if only we hold these national elections, it'll all be hunky-dory. It's been, a, been very, very costly, I think. But on that note, I'm, um, I'm also going to be suffering something very, very costly. So I'm going to, I'm going to rush off. I, apologize. I really apologize. Yeah. You can come and see me tomorrow. It's <laughs> one more wrong. But, um, Great. Um, thank you very much. I think the, all the questions on the red lines, um, we need to debate amongst ourselves. I'll give a last uh, turn to, to Phil. OK, then. great. Yeah, Paul, thank you so much um, for your comments. Uh, you know, a lot for us to, to think about. Let me, let me just make um, a few last points. You know, again, thanks for everyone for, for your patience and sticking it out. And, uh, you know, hopefully you've, you've taken something uh, away from tonight. So one, one um, I want to just come back to this point that what's striking uh, that came out of my research is you see almost these two equilibriums that exist within sub-Saharan Africa, right? Uh, I've spent a lot of time talking about, you know, Sudan, my work there, South Sudan, you know, applied it to Congo, Chad, uh, you know, Liberia. You know, those states have been caught in this vicious ethnic exclusion conflict cycle that keeps repeating itself. Uh, and again, I spent a lot of time in the book thinking about that. How does that work, right? Yes, oh, we're not surprised. You have this link between ethnic exclusion and civil war. Why? You know, why do rulers you know, choose ethnic exclusion, right? And I, the, the fundamental, you know, point I'm making, this is a strategic choice. Let's understand this, right? So that's what I want to get to when we think about institutions. You know, why are rulers making this strategic choice? They're doing it because it's in their interest. They have incentives to. How can we change the incentives or the institutions so they, so they don't do that? So, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, promote or, you know, that there's, you know, one type of government, one type of state. I'm just trying to understand, you know, what are the strategic choices these rulers are making at devastating costs to the society? Uh, how can we change those institutions? So it's helpful. Well, let's look at those other states that seem to be in a different equilibrium because those rulers seem to be making different strategic choices, right? There you have power sharing that is more durable and more persistent. And in these, you know, so what are these cases? Well, Ghana and Benin, um, you know, stand out. And what struck me about looking at bon Ghana and Benin is that you have similar kind of structural conditions as Sudan and Congo, but their rulers have not used violent ethno-political exclusion, but you've had this persistence of ethnic kind of power sharing. But what's interesting about these histories is you've had the coup trap. Right? So in those cases, rulers were choosing policies, power sharing, that led them to have coups more than civil wars. And that was really interesting. And what I, what I, the argument I make is kind of this integrated theory is that the reason they were making these strategic choices is because of power sharing to accept coups because of the ethnic geography of Benin and Ghana, in which each group was relatively you know, large, small states close to the capital, the cost of excluding their rivals was much higher, and such that a coup is less costly than a civil war. Because a coup, we're just trading power, you know, trading power of the executive, but the relative balance of power stays the same. And so I, th I think it's not surprising these countries that have this societal balance of power, they have, you know, given way, the, the democracy has given, uh, has taken over the coup, you know, coup trap. Because that's, you know, a coup trap is a very inefficient way, of course, to alternate power. But in, you know, democracy is much more um, efficient. And I think I, I would push back, too, uh, about Paul's co comment about the, you know, red lines. I think, um, you, know, you know, we're stuck with this, the state structures we have. And the question is, how can we build red lines within these state structures? And I think that's what the African Union is doing, right? But it's imbalanced. Right? There's not, there are strong red lines now from using force to coming to power and seizing power. There are weaker red lines to rigging an election and staying in power. There are weaking red, weaker red lines to changing the Constitution so you stay in power. So, so what's the, the solution? Well, I think, so why are, is the African Union so good at policing coups? Absolutely because it's in the strategic interest of incumbents to shield themselves from coups. 
But I think there's something else going on here because they're, they've also cracked down on rulers who rig elections or, or who lose elections and try to stay in power. So Jamia in Gambia, um, you know, Bagbo in Cote d'Ivoire lost elections, refused to accept defeat, tried to click into power, and the African Union cracked down on them. So, so there is a red line that's being clearly enforced as are coups. And I think one, one issue, what difference here is with these constitutional term limit changes or the constitutional changes is coups and violations of you know, democracy or clean the power after losing are much clearer violations of the rules. Right? There, you know, we have very bright line rules about what constitutes a coup. You know, we all agree when someone uses f f guns to take power, that's a coup. Right? What is a constitutional coup? Is it democratic when in a non-democratic country you have a referendum to allow you yourself to stay in power? There aren't, you know, that's not as clear cut as a coup d'etat. So I think the African Union will strengthen democracy if it strengthens the rules, the, you know, the, the, the bright line rules about what constitutes constitutional infringements. Uh, and that's, that's trickier. And so what's a clear rule that everyone could accept? I think it would be two term limits. And ECOWAS has actually suggested this, that let's, ex you know, we all agree we will only have two term limits. Therefore, we, are, we don't have to worry about this you know, semi-legal constitutional referendum. Um, so what's the downside of that? Well, you know, the upside is we get this alternation of power. And I'm more optimistic about the alternation of power than Paul. Paul's worried that the good leaders will be, you know, will, will, will be forced out. I'm worried the bad leaders you know, will, will, will be stay in. Um, you know, so, but then are we you know, substituting with this rule, are we doing the hard work that societies should do? That Togo, the people in Togo are doing right now, they're mobilizing from below to try to enforce term limits, exactly what Nigerians did, and that's very important for democracy. You know, is it better to let this play out and let society, force society to mobilize or to enforce this from the outside through term limits? But I think there will be a democratic boon that comes from alternation of power that will lead, you know, that will equal democracy, you know, bottom-up mobilizing for, for term limits and would, would suggest that as a way to strengthen constitutional safeguards to make sure incumbents are held as accountable as their rivals are. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for coming and all your questions. Uh, we have got a few uh, copies for sale. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll get so much for doing that. That's great. <laughs> That's great.